All right, on my 2002 tape and probably secondary and third, fourth, fifth, and sixth part of people telling the story over and over again and how it's been moved around the world, uh, Puerto Rico, uh, on my tape I said that things are part of Puerto Rico. The post office is the UPU. The UPU controls uh, all post offices worldwide control the port authorities. Port authorities are the ones that pay the judges because they are they work in a foreign vessel in dry dock. So the the port authorities are not off of the tax the tax rolls because of it being classified as a foreign vessel. When you enter a courthouse, you have left your country. That's why no constitution, rule, or regulation in your country has anything to do with what's going on in that courthouse. I don't care if the judge has got a whole bunch of revised statutes from his state or his federal laws sitting on his desk. They are not part of the piece of paper that is your lawsuit with a stamp and a flag on it. That is the Constitution. That is the only reason why you're in court is because you or the other party filed points of information on this document. If it's written in adverb, verb, the judge is going to say both sides can't read and write. You're both derelict vessels on my foreign vessel in dry dock, and he will conduct himself accordingly based on subjective interpretation and what is fair and equitable for the volition of the thinking of the two parties before him. And if he thinks that both people are con artists and they're trying to rip off each other, he's going to allow the attorneys to go ahead and rip them off. <laughs> that, you know, comes from divorce. Uh, and if, a, if an individual is in there and he has a legitimate claim, physical evidence, quantumized arguments that are absolutely mathematical, the judge has no choice but to allow that individual to win his argument because if he does anything like use the word dismiss, which is a negative condition of state within a quantumized document, which not, does not allow any negative condition of state to exist, he hasn't done anything. You can vacate because vacate comes from value, but you can't dismiss it. Uh, Puerto Rico has got nothing to do with anything. If you want to do the IRS thing and say it belongs in Puerto Rico, I know I made that in my 2002 state tapes and that was through misinformation. Since then I've corrected it on my website. It's the post office uh, globally and the port authorities which you're dealing with. Now taxation in all countries worldwide, uh, as society has evolved, you go to the pol polls and you elect public officials or you will elect specific laws, rules, and regulations to be put on the ballots. Just like it used to be legal to smoke in, in an enclosed area anywhere in Australia. Today it's against the law because, of this, because it violates public safety as far as all different kinds of illnesses that come from smoking. Same thing isn't true in the United States. We have the same laws. Some states haven't enacted all of them yet, but uh, like 60% of all people that live in Florida are over the age of 60. Their immune systems are weaker than a 20 year old. And therefore the laws in Florida say there is no smoking in any enclosed area anywhere in the state. Not in bars, bowling alleys, restaurants. But in the northern regions of the, of the country where you have a young population, smoking laws are still there because young people like to smoke and they haven't passed those laws yet in our states but there, it's coming where it's becoming nationalized. You don't get federal aid if you have smoking in your, in your state, so it's, the state goes ahead and they pass the laws accordingly. In other words, they're blackmailed into it. <laughs> uh, and uh, there was comments made about the $400 million that was won at the World Court in the Jeb Ski cases. Those were all disqualified by me. That never happened. That was misinformation that was circulated. And uh, I went to The Hague and I personally got the lawsuits and they were all disqualified. So that never took place. There was never any banking monies transferred uh, or judgments paid out on any of that stuff. Skiba was indicted by the Boston Grand Jury 
And because he's a friend of mine, Boston Grand Jury did an adverb verb indictment. Indictment meaning no. Uh, well, I'll spell it for you. That's the way they spelled indictment from the grand juries. And what that says is, I is an adverb, modifies the adjective N, which modifies the pronoun D, which is connected by the adverb I, which is connected by the adjective C, the adjective T, the, adjec uh, the pronoun uh, M, the adverb E, the adjective T, and the pronoun T. Because it's underlined and the continuance of evidence is broken, this here, all letters in the alphabet are, are facts. Your vowels become, the I's are vowels, and, uh, but they're used as adverbs in this argument. And I and E ears are interchangeable. So what they've done here is they've done a 134, 1334, 134. It's not a word, it's an acronym of misinformation. And when I corrected it, this happened in uh, Frank Marinfino's case. For $1.3 million and 17 years in prison for failure to pay taxes between the ages of 18 and 34. I was then called in and I took the witness stand. It was a very unique story. The judge was fired for two years because of it. The, uh, I took the witness stand <clears throat> and I said, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I have a question for you. DA jumps up and says, Mr. Miller, you cannot, ask the question, you cannot ask questions of the jury. I says to the DA, I says, well, if I can't ask the jury questions, I can't qualify if they're smart enough to understand my answers. The judge says, Mr. Miller, you can't ask the question of the jury. I says, well, then I'll ask you the question, Your Honor. I says, and you ask the jury. It's your court. You've got ruling on that. He says, yeah, it's my court. He says, I'll tell you what, Mr. Miller, he says, uh, this, uh, this question, if I don't like to question, will you spend six months in jail? Yeah, no problem. He says, it's really that important that this question be asked of the jury. I says, absolutely. I says, if you don't ask the jury this question, how are they supposed to know what I'm saying to them? And the judge goes, well, it must be a pretty important question if you're willing to spend six months in prison over it. And the district attorney stands up and says, I object, Your Honor. Mr. Miller's not allowed to talk to a jury. He says, overruled. He says, Mr. Miller, you will whisper in my ear the question, and I will then ask the jury. So I whispered in the judge's ear, and the judge goes, you know, that's a really good question. <laughs> he goes, I would really love to see the answer. He says, if I don't like your answer, after you ask the jury the question. No, he says, if you don't have an answer for me after I ask the jury a question, I am going to sentence you to six months in prison if I don't like your answer. And he says, so be it. He says, okay, we have a contract. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I'd like to see a show of hands. Does two plus two equal four? And all 12 hands went up. I says, this, and I blurted out, does T-O plus T-O-O equal F-O-R? Does T-W-O and T-O equal F-O-R-E? The DA jumps up and says, your Honor, I like to hold Mr. Miller in contempt for making fun of the jury. I says, what do you mean I made fun of the jury? You spelled indictment with underlining each letter. You misrepresented, rep, misrepresented the value of this word, and these people thought that there was an indictment against Frank Marinfino. I says, by your own trickery of syntax, and you wrote the documents in adverb verb, and the IRS supplied you with information in adverb verb. You both acted in the conspiracy to obstruct this jury, and this jury didn't know any better because you read off what you are here for today. So you committed a fraud in syntax, you committed a fraud in communication skills, you committed a fraud three to, in, uh, in two plus two equals four. I says, this jury would know a, an apple from an orange. I says, based on syntax. And, the DA, and then the, the jury jumps up, uh, not the jury, the uh, IRS jumps up and says, we have no claim against Frank Marinfino. And then the, the DA jumps up and says, 
Well, my claimant has not withdrawn all charges. I have no claims against Mr. Frank Marantino. The judge stands up and says, Frank, there's no charges against you. You're free to go. You don't owe them any taxes. You're not going to jail. You're a free man. Mr. Miller, get out of my court. You got 15 <laughs> seconds, and I'm going to have you arrested for trespassing as a derelict vessel in dry dock. <laughs> so I proceeded to walk out of the courtroom, and then he said, Frank, do you know what was just said? Frank goes, no. He says, what do you mean? You don't have any knowledge of what just happened here today? He goes, no. He says, Mr. Miller has the knowledge. He says, and I copied him. Oh, you cheated. You copied. You don't have knowledge. Federal Rules of Civil Procedure 12B1s. I hold you in contempt of court for perjury. As you came to this court under false pretenses, and you don't know what you're doing. 18 months in jail. And he went to jail for perjury. The judge. The judge sentenced him to 18 months. But as soon as he vacated the case, he recused himself from the trial and then started under judge's motion a new trial to hold Frank Marinfino in contempt for copying and not having knowledge. And from that day forward, every judge in America used the rules and regulations of knowledge to certify if you are qualified to come into court and make an argument. So if you're going to write a syntax document and correct a fiction document and identify the facts on that as to be a lie, you better know how to walk and chew gum at the same time, just like I do in this program. And then, see, so don't even challenge me anymore because the only thing they do is get beat up and really highly embarrassed. By the way, the judge on this case, Pregason, his father is the grand Masonic master of the entire state of California and the chief judge of the Supreme Court of California. His father had to fire his son because I testified in court under syntax and used the fact in court and vacated a jury, as well as a DA in the Internal Revenue Service. No one in the history of California ever defeated the IRS or a jury. And the fact that I could go in and blow these guys out of the water and I do it every time I walk into court, it became a danger to allow me even into the courthouse, let alone into a courtroom or even file a lawsuit. And I've got worldwide reputation for that. That's why you guys get, you hear so many stories about me out here in Australia and New Zealand. But it's always fun when I go to court. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any questions? Uh, Dave, if we get skillful enough to write in syntax and we turn up to court and correct uh, documents um, and ask the other party why they've uh, fraudulently conveyed language and committed mail fraud and all the other things, we notice them of that and of all the uh, penalties, can't they turn the tables on us? Because if we've written to them in adverb verb or we've even signed documents in adverb verb... You're not held to a not... high standard. You're not a licensed bar attorney that went to college for six years to study how to mechanically and mathematically create fraud. They're held to a high standard, you're not. Simple so as that. It's a culpable action on their behalf, is it? Yes. It's engineered, it's not an accident, it's a mathematical engineer. Um, in the word indictment, you said 134, 133, 4134. They only just sent individual letters. How do we know? Because it's underlined. It's the underlining and the space between underlined because it's a, it's a word, a, a, a letter, a space and another letter and is specifically broken with an underline. If it would have been a continuous line, that would have been a different story, but he specifically underlined it to separate each letter to be a separate entity. Because all words in the alphabet are, uh, I mean not all words, all letters of the alphabet are nouns, and it says so, you can look at any dictionary in the world, they identify them to be nouns, but A and I and E and O and U are used as independent letters and they have multiple definitions. So the vowels? The vowels change the, or have values. And it's like I makes, is a person, A is a conjunction, I is also a conjunction. So what makes N a, uh, an adjective and what makes... Because when you put a noun in front of a noun, it becomes an adjective pronoun. It's a modifier. It colors it. Even though you don't think N is a, N is a, 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 uh, is a color, but when you do it in this format, this is called a syntax. This is specific engineered syntax, and you can't pay attention to the fact that this is a D and this is a, uh, a N and a D 
The fact is that if you put a noun in front of a noun, this is an adjective, and you have to have an adverb in front of that to make this a pronoun, and then it has to be connected by an adverb. That's the syntax, and the syntax says that this is a lie, that this is not the word indictment, it's just a series of letters that were written independently with a fraudulent syntax, with a modified condition of syntax and not a word. And the fact that they were underlined indicates that a person who did it understands syntax. Exactly. It was an engineered lie to a jury. He lied to a jury and I caught him. That's perjury. And when you obstruct a jury, you're looking at 10 years in prison. The judge got fired over this for two years. And Douglas, his, his clerk of the court, was fired right along with him because he's the puppet master. And two years later, Pregason and his, his clerk of the court was back in the, the, the Daney case. And guess who walked into the courtroom? Me. He wasn't even on the bench a week. And I come walking in and I sit down. Oh, no. And then Douglas goes, Judge, Miller's here again. <laughs> The and the Danny case attention. went on for six weeks, and we won the case. I mean, they, they did everything in their power to get these people to talk to them. And the only thing that Danny's had to say, there were six of them involved, to the prosecuting attorney was, can I see the set, correct sentence structure, communication syntax? To the judge, to the prosecuting attorney, and to the jury, for six consecutive weeks, never broke and said anything but, can I see the correct sentence structure? And in the end, they, they vacated the case. 18 months later, they intimidated them enough to get lawyers. And the minute they got lawyers, eh, it was about a week later, they all went to prison for three and a half years because their lawyers silenced them from using syntax and volunteered for them to go to jail and put them all in jail. Nice, solicitors. Yeah. Um, and in the <laughs> middle of the word, you've got the uh, C and the T. Well, it, how come the C didn't become a modifier for the T, for the other noun, for the phone? Because... M, anytime you can have a whole bunch of now, you, I can have uh, 20 adjectives in front of a pronoun. But I can't have, a pronoun can't be in front of a pronoun. Only an adjective can appear in front of a pronoun, and the only thing that can follow a pronoun is an adverb. These are rules and regulations that cannot be violated in syntax. So M is a pronoun? M here is used as a pronoun because it's followed by an adverb. Oh, it's affected from, of course. Right, frontwards and backwards. Right, yes. Uh, yeah, g'day, David. Um, my question is not exactly about um, yeah. where, where, where we're at there. Um, I, I have a, an, an international uh, commercial shipping certification right. uh, that's issued to me. Um, by a body called AMSA, which is the Australian Maritime Safety Authority. Uh, they issue a document called the STCW95. Uh, you've got to go away and do a course and you've got to do all, right. all kinds of things to, to get that. Um, during that course, um, you know, they get, they're getting you ready for your life out, out at sea, um, mm -hmm. you know, doing commercial shipping. Um, and they made a couple of points very, very clear to us at, at this course. Um, and that was, you, you basically, your qualification became irrelevant because that just got logged on the system and, and you were. Um, your passport was irrelevant because you might be in a home port. Right. Okay? But the moment I step off my ship and I go down that gangplank and, and, and get onto that wharf, and, and I want to walk back up those, uh, that, uh, stairway and get back onto the ship, I need, I need to make sure I've got one very important thing in my pocket. Your medical certification that you are not transporting any contagious diseases. And it's the most important piece of paper I have. Public safety has jurisdiction over all things on planet Earth. And I'd just like to make this point. How many of you have seen some of these, there, there's a disaster movie where a plane comes from Europe and there's a a terrorist on board releases a noxious uh, a virus on board the plane. The plane is ordered to be vaporized by the military before it enters U.S. airspace. Uh, Harrison for uh, Harrison uh, Rex Harrison uh, and Sophia Lorenz made a European movie, The Cassandra Crossing. 
or a, or a, a train had a poisonous, had a disease on board. It stopped, they sealed that, that, that train up, and they were going to destroy it at the Cassandra Crossing. But because they had a medical team on board the train, they, were, they realized that they could cure the disease with oxygen at 20% rather than 14.6, which is atmospheric, and saved everybody's lives and were able to stop the train and prove that they didn't have to be disintegrated and killed, you know, everyone killed on board, and everybody's life was saved at the end of the movie. The point is that if you, the Black Plague, because it wiped out half the population of the world, or if you have some, what they call the devil virus, gets free, doesn't, that, viruses don't know any boundaries. There's been enough movies made about how a, a deadly virus can get, get free and destroy the population of mankind. Uh, the Omega Man is another one, uh, the new one they just come out with. Uh, let's see, what's another one they did? That, the Omega Man was done with uh, Charlton, Heston. Charlton Heston, right. And then the new one is with uh, Wilson. Wilson. So I guess my question is, David, um, when, when, I, when I board a, uh, a, a, uh, a foreign vessel in dry dock, the court, the court is the same way. You walk into a foreign vessel in dry dock, I tell everybody, if you're going to do a <clears throat> syntax, because they arrested several of our people, saying you have a mental disease and we're going to put you in a mental institution, because well, you're a quantum in a world of fiction, you didn't know where you were. So what we did is we made sure all of our students went into the courthouse with a quantumized document and also had their medical papers saying they have no contagious diseases and are mentally sound. And so when the judge stood up there and made the comment, because he's the captain of his vessel, uh, we held our medical papers up and says, we're, we're board certified to be healthy. We know exactly who we are and what we're doing. Thank you. And that stopped that. And no one's gone to, been locked up anywhere in the planet for the last 10 years. So that was the only defense they had back then. But then we came back with, show me, judge, your board certification that you're a doctor or you're a psychiatrist or you have any kind of mental training, and it disqualified them. So, another question. Uh, David, when you mentioned the titles, like you mentioned 41A, et cetera, where do we find those? Where can we, are they American or Australian? Or okay, all the titles, whether it be in your country, my country, China, Russia, doesn't matter where it's from. The piece of paper that we call the courthouse, you have to define your title. If I want to say Title 18, 241 is conspiracy, and I assign it a definition, it's just a reference within this document, and that's what it means, because I defined it with a quantum definition. I could say Title 18, USC 3 is conspiracy. I could say ABC equals cons conspiracy, as long as someplace where I take that abbreviation and I assign a definition to it on this vessel when this vessel goes into court. Now what I've done is I've taken their definitions and their definitions when they are written Title 42, that's the way the government writes it. Well I went ahead and I said well that's not the right way. First off it has to have a colon to make this is for the Title 42 and this is a hyphen, wrong way, yeah, this is a hyphen tilde. It's a, the hyphen separates the word because tilde is a location. 42 is not a value. The government called it a value. It's a location where you find a definition. So I was grammatically correct and copyrighted the correct use of punctuation around the words. And when I copyrighted, a judge will look at that. He knows what his fiction site is. And I've already syntaxed it so he knows what the definition is corrected. And then it's assigned to my documents. That way I can communicate both in the fiction and fact world simultaneously. Now my copyrights in the United States, or rather my copyrights for these, this technology is worldwide. I don't care what government you go to, all courthouses are foreign vessels in dry dock, and you are not in Australia. You are not under re Australia revised statutes or state of New, New South Wales statutes. You are whatever it says on that piece of paper. 
So if, you're, if you go in there with a half-baked definition and a half-baked attitude and you don't know what you're doing, he will declare you to be a derelict vessel who doesn't know up, down, left, or right, in or out, and he will harvest you for trespassing on his vessel. So don't make nonsense. If you file nonsense, it will be treated as nonsense. Yes? So would you suggest that you notice the court in advance, 10 days in advance of uh, the court document that you, you plan to... No, uh, because when up? you file it, that tells the judge by contract that he's got 45 days to schedule it for a, a hearing based on the forensic evidence that's in that document. If he cannot, dis if he cannot vacate your ability to communicate at a level of mathematical accuracy, then he has to give you a court date. Now, from the time you file the papers, you're going to get a received document stamp, which starts a clock that runs for 30 days. At the end of 30 days, you must have within that 30-day window service upon the people that you are talking to and that information of service back to the judge, and the judge then will issue a, a summons to answer the court within 20 working days. Saturdays and Sundays don't count in a state. And it's 60 days for federal because Saturdays, Sundays, holidays, they all count. But it all comes out to be a 45-day trust law then because they're giving you 45 working days of the 60. Now, the 60 days that they are talking about that the federal courts always tell you that you've got an answer is a trap. We don't give them 60. That's in their world of fiction. You take 45-day trust law which vacates, you got 10 day answer and a 10 day answer back to the answer, that's 60 days. You vacate your own case because you don't know the difference as to what you're supposed to be doing. So you will only allow 20 days for an answer and because it's a syntax, a syntax document, you set down the rules and regulations, can their answer not be, them. Can their answer be that they need more time? No, don't give it to them. Also, they're going to ask because at the minute you waiver your, your time, your 45 day speedy trial, they can wait 10 years before they answer you back. They can't win in syntax, so anything they're going to do is tie it up in time. Don't give them the, don't give them a, don't give them the time. Also, if we feel we're proficient enough to speak, uh, to write in the truth, but not, maybe not to speak in it. Uh, two plus two doesn't equal four. Speaking is irrelevant. Only what's written counts. So you notice the court that you're happy to traverse in adverb verb? The court's going to make a summary decision based on the forensic evidence that you present to them on paper. Yep. The only thing, reason they're going to bring you into the court is trying to entrap you to disqualify your own paperwork. And so, so you would speak in syntax to notice them that, that uh, as it's written, say, Philip? Nine out of ten cases are done under summary judgment based on the forensic evidence of the lawsuit presented to the judge. It's only, uh, if they want to do a put up a show for everybody, they'll go ahead and have a court hearing for it. Or if they know that there's a condition of perjury on the table, they'll get the man to confess to perjury. I can get anybody in this room to confess to perjury and you won't even know it's happening. <laughs> See, if you, if you drop a frog into hot water, he'll jump out. If you drop, drop a frog into cold water and bring it to a boil, you will cook him and he won't know he's being cooked because he's cold blooded. It's the same thing with the courtroom. If you make everybody feel warm and fuzzy, they're going to cooperate. If you shock them, they're going to get all scared and run away. So you want to be able to, you get more bees with honey than you do with vinegar, or flies. <laughs> the, the story you were relating before about the guy that had the, with the IRS, yeah. and you won the case for him. After that, on his way out, the judge pulled him up because he wasn't familiar with what was going on, the judge was able to... Right, I had about six in. hours, I had six hours to give him a briefing as to what I was going to do. How far can the judge go with that, for instance, if, if someone went to court, had you representing them in court, but didn't understand to the extent that you do, and the judge was questioning that person? And okay, if that person I, makes a mistake, and he say, well, you don't know what you're doing, David might, but you don't. Right. So. Baden's case happened over in New Zealand that way. And Baden admitted he couldn't walk and talk like I did. And the judge had him for breakfast. In, uh, in uh, the Krummermeyer case, which is up on the internet under scams, uh, Krummermeyer went to prison for three years under IR he, he, excuse me. He was in an IRS case. 
we defeated the IRS case because the language was a lie. But 10 minutes before he was sentenced, I found out that he had cashed $800,000 in insurance checks, which were never made public to me, but the DA's office kept it secret until he made his final delivery, saying, you didn't pay taxes on the insurance checks. You laundered money. You lied to the court and to the jury that you didn't have any checks. I've got $800,000 in checks you signed. I'm going, well, that's perjury. So he got sentenced to three years, four counts of perjury, which was 30 years in prison, and they only give 10%. So he got three years of hard time in a federal penitentiary. But this is the third time he's gone to prison over perjury for IRS claims on checks. Do you think he'd learn the first time? In that case, <laughs> I, in that case I can understand. But if, if you were to represent someone else, like for instance the cases that you've done here in Sydney with, with the children, couldn't the judge do the same in all those cases, saying, well, the person that you're defending doesn't know what you're doing? Or the doesn't all the people that I have gone to court with have been briefed by me and have spent probably 10 hours of pre head banging with me to know what I am doing so they understand what is going on. Yeah, but not to your extent, it doesn't matter if they make, if the judge- They still can't the walk the mistake. walk and talk the talk as, as to my extent, no. but the fact that I disqualified the court and everything that they're doing in the court, the court can't move forward. It doesn't matter whether you can read or write, the court doesn't have any jurisdiction in the first place once they were disqualified. I'll be in court March 2nd, as a matter of fact, down in uh, Sydney, in Dr. Masu's case. For all the, anybody here from Sydney and you want to go to court and watch me. Yes, Sam? You said you can do something. <laughs> You're making me feel self-conscious now. <laughs> you said you can disqualify um, and get people to admit for perjury by using the, um, uh, the, the process of, uh, you know, was it the- Cross-examination. Cross-examining and um, right. uh, catching them with honey by making them feel good about themselves and getting them to, uh, to, to answer the questions. And then when you ask the last one, you, they, they caught themselves and you right. catch them in the act. But, um, and you also mentioned about the, uh, the fact that the judge will only make a finding on the facts. I mean, it is my understanding that the judge can actually accept evidence, verbal evidence, uh, according to their system. Can the judge admit verbal evidence and ignore, uh, I'm sorry, can the judge admit verbal evidence from the, from the bar? And ignore the written used, contract? That can be used to to disqualify the syntax? Uh, what you're saying is, yes, the individual can kill his own case by saying, I don't know what's happening because somebody else wrote this for me. That Not statement will disqualify. Sorry? That evidence will disqualify. And I'll tell everyone in this room right now, I don't need your permission to prosecute the judge for anything he does to you. I have knowledge and they know I have knowledge and I can go into court over your objections to my interfering with your case and prosecute the judge and the DA for violating your civil rights because you can't read and write. And I have that authority. I can do that in any country worldwide. So the judge can't use his intelligence against you like I've seen, what's that woman on TV all the time at 2.30? Yeah. Judge, judge Judy. Judy. <laughs> I've seen her violate several basic human rights. No, no, she it. didn't. The first thing that starts out and that all those TV judges are saying is these people signed a contract to vacate their civil rights, vacate their contract rights, and allow the judge to make a determination over to their oral arguments in court of common sense. And those are just common sense trials. Sometimes they have very good arguments. You might pick up a few points to pay attention to. Other days, there ain't a court in the world allow a circus to take place like that. It's, up to, it's totally up to the discretion of the judge. And, and we got a guy, we had a judge up in Wisconsin. He got, he got disbarred, as a matter of fact, and it was found guilty of uh, sexual crimes. But he walked around with a, the old ping pong paddles where he had a little ball with a rubber band on it. In a murder trial, he'd walk around and he'd play with this thing. 
<laughs> because both sides were talking in adverb verb, the contracts were in adverb verb, the jury couldn't read and write, and he knew about syntax, and he knew that all these people were illiterate in front of him, so he just played with this, this rubber ball paddle. His board. And everybody thought he was nuts. And then he was, when he was challenged by the chief judges, he said, well, these guys can't read and write. It's a syntax argument. I'm not going to tell them anything. I'm just going to do what I'm going to do at the end of the trial. I don't care what the jury says. He says they're in a box. It's an enclosed area. They can't hear evidence or see witnesses. I'll make a determination after the fact. And if I don't want to put my foot in there, I'll let the jury do whatever they want to do. And, and, and if I don't like what they do, I'm going to override them. And I'm going to make my own decision anyways. I had a case where the jury came back and said, this man is not guilty. The judge says, listen, ladies and gentlemen, you don't seem to understand. I told you to go back in there and find this person guilty. That's not a request. That's an order. You will find them guilty as charged, or you're going to sit in there for as many months as it takes. And they kept the jury in there for a week, 24 hours a day. Wouldn't let them out of the jury room until they came back with a guilty. And no matter how many times they kept... They had to keep fighting and fighting and fighting, and finally they all gave in, and they said, okay, we find you guilty, so they could go home to their families. So then the judge got sued by the Greater Sur Jury Association for fraud. The jury, and the, when it got to the higher court, the judge went in and said, the guy was, everybody lied. It was an adverb verb case. Syntax was on the table, and they all lied. They're all guilty. Um. He may not have been guilty of the crime that they said he was, but he was guilty of lying on multiple counts of perjury, which added up to more time for perjury than he did for the, the guilty for what he was actually in court for. A bit like Al Pacino. So he wanted to use a distraction. He didn't want Syntex being put on trial. He didn't care what was put on trial. He was just going to put this guy in jail because he lied to the court and the judge knew it. See? But he didn't want to give out any secrets, so he changed the rules. Okay. All right. I'll get back on point here. This here is a graph. Your mind, now this is the same. These are the, the title sites are in the back of the business card. These are the words. Now, the numbers can be anything you want throughout any country you happen to go through. But the causes of action of these conditions of words follow in a specific order. Now, you have to be able to prove each one of these words through the title site and the definitions which are expanded upon on both the website and my book if you wish to study those. So the question is, these are the players, you got your, your judge who works with the DA barrister, who works with the sheriff bailiff, who works with the clerk of the courts who files papers, and then the police department who goes out and investigates on the street or is your professional witness. Now, the end of, uh, Let's say this pen is a knife, okay? Now a knife, the word knife is 